Radio MD. RadioMD.com. It's health delivered daily. Melanie Cole's Health Radio. Well, according to recent research, at least 60% of the adult population will experience some type of gastroesophageal reflux disease. GERD. Within the next year, so many millions of people take that little purple pill or so many things that they try for GERD and they say, oh, I've got reflux. And if left unattended, it can cause problems. My guest today is Dr. Mark Knorr. He's a gastroenterologist and therapeutic endoscopist who specializes in the advanced treatment of digestive diseases. So Dr. Knorr, GERD, People are using these PPIs, these proton pump inhibitors. What is GERD? What do the PPIs do? And then we'll get into some other things we can do for them. Thanks, Melanie, and great question. So reflux disease, or GERD, comes in a couple of different forms. But what it really is is that that sphincter muscle at the bottom of your esophagus that protects your esophagus and airways and larynx from Uh, food or digestive enzymes or acid coming up gets weakened over time. So this is a chronic degenerative disease that's part of Western society mostly. And it's due because because we can eat more, because we eat more than we should be eating. We're eating too late at night. We're eating things that make that sphincter weak. But, But the net sum is after a period of time, that sphincter is too weak to resist the normal contraction and pressure building of the stomach, which we call the gastric yield pressure. And so what comes up is acid, bile, digestive enzymes, food, and it can come all the way up into the uh, lungs. It can come up into the larynx, causing hoarseness, LPR we call that, or it can just stay in the esophagus, causing heartburn. And so the first drug people use typically is going to be a PPI or a proton pump inhibitor designed to lower the acid level because in many people, just lowering the acid just a bit makes them feel better. But what's important here is taking the medicine does not stop the reflux. The reflux continues, you just feel better. Wow. So it doesn't actually stop the problem, it just deals with the symptoms. First question, Dr. Noor, do you think people should have an endoscopy on a regular basis? Now with colonoscopy being covered as part of the Affordable Care Act, do you think endoscopy should be as well? I think if you are someone who has had many years of reflux symptoms and you have not been successful in being controlled, you deserve an endoscopy at least once to make sure that you're not developing any precancerous cells. And also to give your doctors a better idea of what actually is causing your reflux and what's the best way to treat it. But the fact is is that if you're taking medication and you're dependent upon medication and lifestyle changes don't work, you need a sphincter targeted therapy and that's what we're doing more and more for people who don't respond to medicine, who are dependent upon medicine. We're trying to build that sphincter back up to normal. Okay, so depending on these medicines, and we hear about some alternatives, and you've mentioned, and we don't want to call them alternatives because some of these things are just another form of the same kinds of medicine. Now, you mentioned eating late at night and certain types of foods, sitting up after whatever. Now, what about apple cider vinegar, regulating the pH? Is there ways to stop it before it starts? So again, um, these methods like apple cider vinegar, which helps to perhaps raise the pH a little bit higher than the normal pH of acid, which is a pH of one or two, the apple cider vinegar is three, and this kind of partially neutralizes the acid and makes it weakly acidic. Some people may respond to that, but many do not. And again, these are all methods that get away from trying to fix the underlying problem. When you've arrived at that point in your life where you've had enough abuse to your system or your system is old enough now where that sphincter is loose, we really need to think about natural ways of trying to tighten up that sphincter. And there are some procedures, in particular the strata procedure, which actually naturally causes the sphincter to regrow using electrical stimulation, and then you get your sphincter strength back and frequently don't need any medication. Wow, that's pretty cool. And is this some of the new research that's going on and getting that sphincter to regrow? And where's that being done? So a lot of this research began in uh, about the year 2000. Much of it I have also been the author of. 
And um, we've been doing this, again, since the year 2000, and it's becoming, I think, more and more popular, again, for those patients who are just not able to get off the medications and lead normal lives. And then beyond that, there, of course, can be surgery, things that are much more invasive that actually force the surgeon to change how your anatomy looks to also try and stop the reflux from coming up. But, but really right now, the only one that can do it more naturally is going to be the strata procedure, which is really just an endoscopic procedure. Wow. So people can do these things. And what other bits of health advice do you have for people that suffer from gastroesophageal reflux? Or, I mean, even kids can sometimes get this. I know my daughter had as it a baby. And it certainly wasn't because she was eating too much before bed. But so I, some people, it's just going to happen. So give us your best advice for ways that we can hopefully prevent it. Sure. Well, I mean, first is children. You know, as, as we're born as infants, our digestive system is not completely developed. And as we our babies are always spitting up. And the reason they're spitting up is their, their stomach, the J shape of their stomach that gives them a reservoir, hasn't yet completely formed yet. Now, that happens over the first several months. And so the spitting up usually stops. The refluxing usually stops. Now, for five to six million children, they still suffer from reflux and terribly because they can't grow normally, they can't eat normally, and they're constantly spitting up. But for the most, most kids, they will outgrow this by the time uh, they reach their 10 to 12 years old, by the time they're teenagers, and, and really nothing else needs to be done. Now, as for the adults and as for the teens, um, it's really important not to overeat eating small amounts of food. I always say never eat more than the size of your fist in terms of volume. That's what your stomach was designed to hold and digest. At the same time, don't eat within three to four hours of bedtime. Uh, Stay away from things like alcohol, chocolate, peppermint, the things that we know, tobacco, things that we know that cause loosening of that sphincter. And if you do these things and you don't over distend your stomach with food over time, then the stomach acid will stop digesting the sphincter because the stomach is too distended. Think of it kind of like the neck of a balloon. As the balloon gets bigger, the neck gets smaller. As your stomach gets bigger, your esophagus begins to shorten and exposes the lower esophagus to acid digestion. So these are very important tips to try and stay ahead of this disease. And people who are on these PPIs... Dr. Nora, they're, they, as you said, they're just taking care of the symptoms and we need to look at the cause and prevention to begin with. But give them a little bit of what you would say if they're on this for a long time because bone health and it's being linked now to, to things that you just, side effects that are just comorbidities you don't want to have with it. Well, there's, there's clearly a link to bone health. There's increased bone fracture that takes place. Uh, the newer data suggests that there's an increased risk of acute myocardial infarction. Uh, this research is actually very good. Uh, as well, there's some difficulty with infections, such per, uh, perhaps like small bowel bacterial overgrowth. Um, all of these things are important factors that can come out of long-term proton pump inhibitor use. Now, for many patients who are on these for prolonged periods of time, one of the first things I try and do is see if we can't step them down off those medications to something less strong, like an H2 blocker, like a Zantac or a Pepsid or uh, ranitidine is another name for Zantac. Um, So if we can do that successfully, then you don't need the PPIs. Or at the very least, I try and say, let's at least go every other day. And if you're good every other day, maybe we try every three days. Get to the lowest possible dose to protect your bones, to protect your health, but to still keep your symptoms controlled. That is great advice, really, really great advice. And you can see more about Dr. Noor at gastro-doc.com and learn about GERD and learn about proton pump inhibitors and why you don't really want to be on them long term and the best advice about GERD and ways to hopefully prevent it, not just symptom manage. This is Melanie Cole, and you can listen to Melanie Cole's Health Radio Show every day, Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Isn't that great for you? Thanks so much for listening and stay well. Stay well.